Today's episode of Beyond the Mask is presented by the insurance specialists at BrightThink Wealth Strategies. Find the disability insurance coverage that fits you best right now. Email Robert Smith at rsmithjr at financialguide.com. The show is also made possible by the team at CRNA Financial Planning. Get a free consultation today to be guided through the complexities of investing and financial planning. Just visit crnafinancialplanning.com. And don't forget, listening to our podcast can earn you Class B credits. For more information on how you can submit them, check out the CE Credit tab on our website, beyondthemaskpodcast.com. Welcome to Beyond the Mask, innovation and opportunities for CRNAs and advanced practice nurses with certified financial planner Jeremy Stanley and CRNA Sharon Pierce. Jeremy Stanley has worked with CRNAs for more than 23 years, and Sharon Pierce is a former president of the AANA and the NCANA. Join us as we leave the operating room and learn the latest in the CRNA and advanced practice nurse industries. Beyond the Mask starts in 10, 9, 8, 7. Hey Sharon, how was your day? Oh my God. <laughs> it was a Monday. Um, I'm not sure if you want to know how my day was today. I think that's enough but, said right there then, right? Uh, that's it. I come <laughs> in and I was cramming my face real quickly because I haven't even had time to eat. I drove two hours from work to home. So, but it's all good. Oh, good. You were in my hood today, weren't you? You were in my I was and didn't even see you. Gosh, I, I could have probably spit on the office almost from where <laughs> I was working at today. <laughs> uh, I well, missed you. Did you miss me? Of course, always. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think we've got another really good um, episode tonight lined up, and this was one that you kind of pursued, right? I did. I saw her topic whenever we were at Congress, and unfortunately, we just couldn't get together to get her tape, but it's a topic that we have um, discussed quite a bit on the podcast, but I don't think that it can ever be discussed enough. Yeah. Well, let's introduce our guest, Lee Taylor. Lee, welcome to the podcast. Hey, guys. Hi, Jeremy, Sharon. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about you, and then we'll introduce your topic. Absolutely. Uh, so I am originally from Nashville, Tennessee. I did my master's and kind of grew up in my nurse anesthesia career there. And then in uh, 2016, I had a baby and I just thought something more is here, something more I want to do. And I really got into education and I started uh, working at Middle Tennessee School of Anesthesia in the SIM lab and uh, started pursuing my doctorate. And then in Later that year in 2017, they offered me the assistant program administrator position. So I worked at uh, MTSA for about three and a half years in the administration. And then COVID hit and I started asking that question again. You know, what am I doing? Where am I going? What do I want my life to look like? And I have three children. And we just kind of had this realization that we needed to look elsewhere. And so now I'm in Fairfield. Uh, Connecticut. I'm in the Fairfield University nurse anesthesia program, and I maintain clinical practice at uh, within the Yale New Haven Health Systems at Bridgeport Hospital. And um, I'm a state peer advisor for uh, the AANA representing the state of Connecticut now. So I just got one question for you. Do they wear boots up there? And is there a street like Broadway? <laughs> no. And you know what? <laughs> I get asked that question a lot of you know, oh my gosh, you left Nashville. Nashville's the it city. Um, and that would be the number one thing that I miss. Not yeah. boots, but the live music. The live um, music. There, you know, Connecticut's fantastic. We just don't do live music like we do in Nashville yeah. up here. No, no. That's, that's the one thing I love about Nashville is, is just the music and being able to walk out and you've got music after music after music after music. And all of them are great. I mean, everybody's I amazing. Yeah. So. We would have live music in my Trader Joe's in Nashville. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> wow. Well, we're going to be talking, as Sharon said, about a topic that, again, I don't think we can get 
enough information out there. Um, it, it's substance use disorder. And, you know, the name of your topic at the ANA meeting was accountability in the workplace, how to care for your colleagues in a culture of isolation. So I want to hit on that a little bit, but why don't you tell us why this topic is so important, especially right now? Oh, absolutely. And that could make a whole podcast on why this topic means so much. So I'll try to keep this abbreviated. I think we've all had that colleague where we maybe saw something or we noticed something that didn't just seem right. And I didn't speak up and I didn't say anything. And now I have the words for it. I was an enabler. I Mm. thought I was helping, but I was really just enabling the problem. And because I didn't speak up, that person you know, didn't get help. And it's just something that I have really had to work through and really reflect on and has really driven me in what I do now as a state peer advisor. Um, One of our main goals is through is to educate. And thankfully, that lines up with what I see as my passion in my career. And so educating those about substance use disorder is something that I'm really passionate about and really enjoy doing. Now, you said all of us have had this in our career. Now, I'll be perfectly honest. I have not, but it sounds like there was a triggering event for you. Do you care to share that? Yeah, there, you know, there is a triggering event. And because I know your podcast is so well listened to, I think I'm just going to maybe not go into that event out of the privacy of my of my close colleague but what I would like to say and I guess maybe what I was touching on is kind of the incidence of substance use disorder within anesthesia professionals and um, maybe go into some of that data because that's probably the prevalence that I was referring to but you know within the CRNA community we don't have great data. The study that we reference when we're talking about the incidence of substance use disorder was published in 1999. So if you just Mm. think about like current events and things that have happened since 1999, we've gone through 9-11, we've gone through a war, we've gone through now a pandemic. So, so many outside stressors. So we don't have current data around what's the incidence of substance use disorder in anesthesia professionals, but we all think that it's probably a lot higher. You know, Sharon, we had a a young SRNA um, who was actually here in Winston, a a wonderful young lady, and figured out that she was using um, and actually ended up taking her life. Um, And the school and everyone rallied around that situation and now they do a, a 5k run for her and they, they give the money to I think it's a and a um, who, who ends up getting it but why is it so prevalent well, not only in CRNAs but I guess in APRNs in general what what is it about this and like you said I mean the, the last few years hadn't been easy for anybody um, and then you add all these outside stressors on top of that in what you guys do um, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. Uh, so first I know about that student that you were referring to and the, um, and the 5k. And I think it's really important to note that September is suicide awareness month. And, um, I think that that's something that as a peer advisor, I do try to bring awareness to within my own nurse anesthesia community here. And I couldn't let that go, uh, that it is suicide yeah. awareness month and it's important to talk about. Um, But your question was, you know, why do we have such an incidence of substance use disorder within the anesthesia community? And there's really, you know, we don't we don't have hard data on that, but there is a lot of models that describe why that might be. And one of them is the triad of contributing factors. And that's through the availability. Uh, CRNAs are we, we really are there. We're at the hospital a lot. We work nights. We work weekends. Um, it's the accessibility we use a lot of uh, narcotics in our practice and we have very little oversight about the waste or, or, you know, what we do with those narcotics. No one's standing over us watching. And then last is accountability. There's really a lack of accountability within um, professional organizations, within the workplace to require that we take care of ourselves. Right. And then there's a lot of intrinsic factors that can play into that stress, fatigue, burnout, 
genetics. And then we also know from data that um, if you have prior experimentation in the past, then you're a little less invulnerable, but we're all invul invulnerable. We're no nobody's perfect. So those availability and accessibility pieces that I talked about, those can't change with our job. And so the only piece that we can really change, and this is what I was talking about at the AANA, is that accountability piece. And what can we do as providers, um, employers, colleagues, what can we do to foster that culture of care and to foster that sense of accountability for our, not only ourselves, but our colleagues? You know, we interviewed Matthew Zender. You probably are aware of a lot of his work in this area. And he talks about that. And he actually thinks that we need to mandate accountability the same way that the aviation industry does. You have to have a certain amount of sleep. You have, you know, I mean, truck drivers do it. Yeah. Aviation industry does it. But we can still take 24-hour call. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I do. I do know about his work. And I, I was fortunate to listen to him at the AANA and he gave a fabulous presentation. You know, I hear what you're saying. And um, as a mom of three, sleep is just really, really hard <laughs> for me. So probably if you made me write down my hours, um, I probably wouldn't get it even on a good day. But one of the things that I talked about in my presentation was about there's kind of four actionable things that we can do. You know, sleep isn't one for me, <laughs> but uh, what I think one of the first things we can do is what's called using an addictionary. And that's something that I really try to foster in my students is I don't say triggering words like substance abuse or addict or abuser. I really think we need to be aware of our language and how we talk about our patients, because if we're using this shameful language towards our patients and our colleagues hear us, then that's only going to hinder that relationship. If I think that you think that, I, that our patients are bad, well, I'm not going to come to you and share this deep, um, dark secret. Exactly. Like what I'm struggling with, right. I'm not going to share that. So that was really my first kind of how to accept some accountability is to shift the blame from describing someone as a substance abuser and really make it the problem. Make not don't make the person the problem, make the um, substance use disorder the problem. And I think that shift of our language takes it away from the person having the problem and rather the, the disorder is the problem. Have you thought about what would happen if you weren't able to work for two or three years? You know, on average, 25% of people will file a disability claim, and most of us aren't prepared for that loss of income. Every CRNA needs to protect their biggest asset, yourself and your ability to earn with a disability insurance policy. We recommend contacting Robert Smith, a master disability insurance specialist with more than 30 years of experience and 1,800 CRNA clients to find the coverage that fits you best. The best way to do that is to send him an email at rsmithjr at financialguide.com. That's rsmithjr at financialguide.com. Or call him at 504-394-6557. You know, I was reading back through the presentation you gave, and I'm just going to quote some of this. I think this is from the 2019 study, but... You said 4% of APRNs met the criteria for SUD, 15% SU problem within the prior year, 5% of APRNs had used illicit drugs in the prior month, 32%, which just shocked me, of APRNs reported heavy alcohol consumption in the month prior to the survey. Um, Did, was, was there annual meeting that we... Prior to the survey. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, well, well, Sharon, and, and this is one that was really interesting to me. 10% of CRNAs have an SUD, which is higher than the general public. You know, I kept yeah. thinking about that. You know, and, and what goes through my mind is that, one, as I've said, you know, hundreds of times on this show, CRNAs are the smartest people mm -hmm. that I know. 
I mean, they really wonder are. where you got that line. Well, I married one, and she tells me all the time. So, um, and and on top of that, I have to work with you. So you tell me the rest of the time. So fifty fifty. That's what I get. No, I'm just kidding. But but seriously, but I think it's knowledge because you guys understand it and you have access, and I think this leads to that. And then the third part of it is what you guys do is not easy. It is a stressful job. What I also notice is that like everybody does, I mean, I compartmentalize my job in this little box. CRNAs compartmentalize that in a little box, you know, yeah, I've got somebody's life in my hands, you know, but, but it's just part of what I do, you know. Um, But it's still a stress that whether you recognize it or not, there's a huge amount of stress. So, I mean, that just blew my mind that it was that high. Yeah. And that's the old data I was referencing to you. So that's from the 1999. Oh, the is other it? Okay. Yeah. The other statistics you gave were from that, from a 2022 study and they studied APRNs and RNs from the year 2020 to 2021. So during the height, you know, height of the pandemic. Right. And another statistic on there is that 30% of our ICU nurses qualify for a substance use problem. So maybe they don't meet all the criteria for a substance use disorder, but they have a lot of the criteria. So 30%. And that number really hits me home because I work in a nurse anesthesia program. And so those are my ICU Mm -hmm. nurses that I'm now bringing in to a high stress environment and a high productivity environment. Right. And I think, you know, one of the messages that I want to send home, if, if, if you can just stop listening to me, the rest of the podcast, this is my number one tidbit, is that if you need help, there are people out there that want to help you. Me as a state peer advisor, you can find my number on the internet. I'm happy to, I'm happy for you to call. I'm happy for you to reach out and let me help you get the help you need. But if there's any SRNAs listening, your program administrators are there for you. We know that you're in a stressful situation. If you need help, please don't feel ashamed or afraid to come and admit that to us. That is the culture to just hide and say, I don't have a problem because, and here's my theory on why that that is. It's because in the operating room, we're the people that everybody looks to in an emergency, right? So we don't ever like to give the perception that something's wrong. (laughs) You know, we have um, a, a surgery that's gone bad. We're calm. We're handling it. We know what to do. And so we try to do that in our personal lives and say, I'm calm. I've got this when we just need to extend our hand out and ask for help. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of elaborate on that because you just hit home on something. So Sharon, I haven't even talked to you about this, but so Saturday morning, about two o'clock in the morning, my son who's seven woke up and he's screaming at the top of the stairs. So Sarah got up. She runs upstairs, and then I immediately went up afterwards. And he has these episodes, especially if he's croupy, where he can't breathe really well. He doesn't have asthma. I think it's called a tracheomalacia when he was born. And he was a marconium stain baby. So, you know, I mean, all these signs. So, But we've never... We've always been able to get him out of it. So she said, turn the shower on. I turned the shower on. We gave him an inhaler. We could not get him out of this. I mean, he was getting worse and worse. And Sarah being the CRNA, I mean, obviously she understands the airway. And I'm looking to her. And all of a sudden I looked at her eyes. And her Uh -uh. eyes were as big as half dollars. And I thought, oh, this is not good. I said, do we need to go? And she said, yes. So I immediately went downstairs, got dressed, got my daughter up, 2 o'clock in the morning. We live about 24 minutes from the hospital. Um, We were there in 11 minutes. Um, So go in. But exactly what you're saying, I mean, I have never seen her have that look before. And when she had it with my son, I knew you know, that it was something wrong. Now he's fine. Now they had to give him some treatments and and so forth, but we we think he's got a nearing of his, his trachea, which causes that. And obviously when you're crying, you get upset, it, it, you know, it it flexes up and he can't Mm. breathe. And so, but yes, I'm going to digress, but it just made me think about that, that 
I've, I don't think I've ever, as long as I've known her, seen her like that. Sharon, I've never seen you like that ever in my no. entire life, you know. Um, so you're exactly right. CRNAs can handle it. I mean, I in every situation, you guys, you got this. That's all well, I Well, when I started I school, we were told there are two words you never say in the OR. Oh, shit. <laughs> you just don't <laughs> say them ever. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, but no, we were right. indoctrinated. We were indoctrinated to be cool. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah we're the right. calm face that people look to in the operating room, and that's fantastic in the operating Until room. Until it's not right. <laughs> but it needs to not translate into our personal lives. Um, that's that's when uh, we need to be able to reach out and ask for help and say I'm not okay. And and I say that at nausea with my students is. It's okay to not be okay. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, you know, what's not okay is not asking for help. Well, let's go over a few of the signs and symptoms. I think that we can never go over those enough. And, you know, after I said I didn't know anybody, you know, the first person to put me on AAA in a committee was Jan Stewart. And I knew her very well. And obviously, yeah, we know what happened there. So, uh, you know, maybe we all need another lesson in signs and symptoms. So why don't you go over some of those? Absolutely. And the AANA website is fantastic if anybody wants to go and see these kind of bullet pointed out. But, you know, some of the big ones, they break it down into impairment. And so if you think about impairment, that's being under the influence of a substance in the moment. Um, We have some behaviors like severe mood swings, personality changes, poorly explained errors, accidents, injuries, being visibly intoxicated, if ordinary tasks require greater effort or consume more time. And then uh, signs. One of the ones that I like to kind of draw attention to is discovered comatose or dead. We say in our community is that if someone, if you suspect somebody has a substance use disorder going on, then there's three things that are going to happen within a year. They're going to, you know, get the help that they need, which is what we hope will happen. They will get incarcerated or they're going to die. And so we have to speak up if we notice that something is going on, something's different. I think the ANA says it really well. If you see something, say something. So that's your behaviors and signs of impairment. And then drug diversion, that would be uh, signs and behaviors associated with taking drugs from the operating room setting and for personal use. So some behaviors for that is consistently using more drugs for cases than colleagues, consistently arriving early, staying late, volunteering for frequent overtime. You know, we love those people who take that call that we don't want to take, but Is it happening more frequently than it should? And then um, some signs of drug diversion, inappropriate drug dose, uh, drug doses or drug choices for patients, missing, missing meds, broken meds, things that aren't well explained. You know, and I'm just sitting here listening to this list. And then first thing is, I mean, a lot of those can be a lot of CRNAs out there. I mean, without any issues, problems, or anything. And I mean, one of the things that I've learned about a lot of folks, especially early on when they're doing this, um, is that they're extremely high functioning. And I guess my question is probably the same as a lot of people. Well, you know, Lee, what if it was you and I look at you right now and you're very high functioning and you're very well put together, but there's little signs here and there, maybe, you know, but, but it can't be you, right? I mean, you've got it all together and you're coming to work every day and yeah, you're working overtime, but you know, and, and how do you, how do you make yourself as a person look at that friend in a different light or that colleague that is high functioning also thinking that, gosh, if I'm wrong about this, you know, man, what are they going to think about me? I'm going to lose this friendship. And how do you handle that side of this? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. And it's something that I have personally experienced um, as far as asking the question. And I think the way you phrased it is perfect because I had to think, 
how would I personally want to be asked? Well, I would want to be asked this in a, in a careful and a compassionate way. I would hope that the person would ask me with empathy and not in an accusatory manner. And so I think that you have to reflect on, put yourself in their shoes. How would I want someone to talk to me about this? And that's how you approach those situations. So um, there's a lot of resources, once again, about intervention and the safety of providers if you are going to approach them and kind of confront them about a situation. But the number one tip is to, if you're going to have these conversations, don't do it alone and then don't let the person leave your side. Make Their safety is the utmost importance if you're going to confront them in a situation. And then, you know, I think the thing that hinders people from from asking these difficult questions is, oh, this isn't my job. I'm here. I'm just giving anesthesia. I want to clock in and I want to clock out. Right. And I understand that. But if you go back to what I said earlier, if you suspect somebody is diverting or using uh, at work, then we really only have three outcomes for this provider. And so if, if I say that to myself, you know, I can, I can get this person help or they could die. Well, I really want to try to get that person the help that they need. Let's say you want to get them help. Who do you go to? Who do you report to? Give us some of those answers. Absolutely. So I'm in Connecticut and we have a great monitoring agency that helps with this. But the easiest thing to do is to get on the AANA website. Um, We have a 24-7 live line that if you call, someone's going to answer. And it's confidential support. And so that number is 1-800-654-5167. And like I said, someone's going to answer that. It's confidential. You could ask that question. Hey, here's what I think I see. Here's what I think is going on with my colleague. Tell me what to do. And if you are the person with the substance abuse disorder, whatever the proper nomenclature is, you can also call the helpline and say, hey, I've got a problem. Absolutely. This is for anesthesia providers. So this is for CRNAs. This is for um, students. Uh, this is for administrators. This is for anybody. And, you know, our focus with the helpline is for substance use disorder. But if you're in crisis mode and you don't really know what to do and you don't know how to help your colleague, call this number. We're going to help. What are the, I mean, for lack of a better term, what are the drugs of choice? What are, what are we seeing in the anesthesia community that is the go-to? I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind, obviously, would be alcohol. Um, but w- what else are we seeing out there? Thank you so much for saying alcohol, because I think that's commonly thought of as not a drug. And that is our number one, uh, hmm. that's our number one choice of drug, actually, as anesthesia providers. That's what we're seeing more and more. The incidence of, it used to be lumped in as um, a, a alcohol disorder, but now alcohol is, is under that substance use disorder classification, and it's our number one choice. Hmm. Of, of drugs. And I think that's where the enabling piece kind of comes into play because we say to ourselves, well, this is legal. Well, they're not doing it at work. Right. Uh, this is, they're letting go. They're letting go of their bad Monday. And so we make excuses and maybe I should use the first person here. I've made excuses for colleagues and allowed that kind of behavior when it might not necessarily be the healthiest choice for them. Right. Well, speaking of it being legal, I know this is outside of the purview of this podcast, but it's going to be interesting as marijuana becomes legal in more and more states. Yeah. How we start dealing with that, even with uh, providers. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. Um, You know, my go to has always been if a student has, you know, misplaced narcotics or has, you know, I don't know lost narcotics because we know mistakes happen. I've always said, you know, I'm going to send you for a drug test. This is not punitive. This is to safeguard that you lost narcotics and we're just demonstrating that you didn't take those narcotics. So that's how I approach that situation. But now as marijuana becomes legal, it's definitely on my mind. I don't want to send students to, to drug tests because 
you know, marijuana is under that tin panel. And, and then what, what do I do if I find that? Wow. So that's true. Wow. I didn't even think about that. Uh-uh. Yeah. No. A podcast for another day. A that's podcast also a for long another topic. day. That is. Yeah. <laughs> Beyond the Mask is made possible by the team at CRNA Financial Planning. With almost two decades of experience, the firm guides CRNAs through the complexities of investing and financial planning. Schedule a free consultation today by calling 855-304-3748 or go online to crnafinancialplanning.com. So uh, what about opiates, propofol, those, those types of drugs? Um, are, are we seeing those as well? Yeah. So once again, this is old data, but opiates are the number one, after alcohol, the number one uh, choice of drug. And uh, what we normally think of, I think if you kind of just pictured that generalized person who is using drugs then we picture track marks, right? Mm. On arms. That's one of the things we look for. But what we found, and this kind of goes into to what you said, uh, Jeremy, is that CRNAs are smart. So we know right. how to get around that and to not have the track marks. And so really the preferred route is nasal. So don't let that be a cue where you're saying, oh, I don't see track marks they can't be using. Well, we now know that the nasal route is really the is the preferred route. Wow. Did you know that, Sharon? No, but I do remember whenever I was in school 100 years ago, there was a resident who had put his own femoral line in and had run tubing down his pant leg and was shooting up in the operating room. That's how smart, how smart he was to do mm. that. Mm. Right. And that's kind of back to that triad of accessibility, because not only do we have it available, but we can dose ourselves to avoid, you know, the effects. Like I'm here by myself. Let me dose myself. So nobody knows when I come in, you know, if they come into my operating room, I'm going to time it just right. And I'm going to give myself just the right dose. So funny, you know, um, Sharon also knows this, but I had to have a colonoscopy. I've reached that age where I had to have a colonoscopy. So, you know, I go in and I, I know the CRNA and, you know, he's going to give me propofol and I'm thinking, I'm going to fight this. He's not going to put me down, you know, and I'm laying there, <laughs> I'm laying on my side and I look up at David and I'm talking to him and I see this tube of white stuff and he goes, okay, we're going to get started. And I'm like, great. And so I'm, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden the right side of my face got hot and I'm good. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going down. I'm not going down. And I woke up and they're like, oh, we're done. We're, done. we're out of here. And I'm like, <laughs> dang it. I couldn't even last for like three seconds. You know, <laughs> first time you've ever heard that line. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. Wow. Now that's a good lead in to stigma and shame. How about that? Uh, Great lead in. So good. (laughs) I was just going to share with you, Jeremy. I also recently had surgery. I had a bad bike accident and broke my clavicle and I had to have an ORIF of my, um, of my clavicle. And it's funny because I got in the, in the ambulance where they're taking me to the, to the hospital. I'm in a lot of pain. And the EMT says, I'm going to give you some fentanyl. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. How much fentanyl are you going to give me? He's like, I'm going to give you 100 mics. I'm like, "Mm, let's do 50 mics. Like, (laughs) hold on. (laughs) Because I live and breathe this. And I thought, you know, this is how it starts, right? You have have an accident Mm -hmm. and you you get fentanyl. And then I get, I go home on pain medications and, and I was just seeing that cycle happen to me because that's how it begins for so many people. Yeah. Um, I know that I believe with the, you know, several of the Jan Stewart lecture series, we've heard that before. And I was just seeing that um, happen to we, myself. And do we have a quantifier to that? Do we have any idea of what the percentage is of SUD comes from at all start injury? With- I don't know. I don't know that if there I is, high, um, I know, you know, just from stories I've heard, it's come from, I hurt my back at work or I had this injury or I had to have this surgery and, and it, the pain medication. And then I had to go back to work and I was in pain still mm-hmm. and I wasn't able to stay home and recover like I needed to. And so that I've heard a lot of those stories, but um, no, I don't know the, the incidents off the top of my head. 
let's go back to this point that you made earlier about the students. And the reason why I'd like to discuss this just a little bit more, we also had this conversation with Matthew Zender in talking about the students that we are getting into the programs now are the students, they're the students who were nurses during COVID Mm -hmm. and they're coming out with a whole different coming into our, our our programs with a whole different level of anxiety and stress. They're already burned out because they've been through COVID for the last two years. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Oh, I've seen it, actually. There are great resources for these students um, for this. It's a trauma, right? They've gone through the trauma of living and caring for patients with COVID. And that doesn't just magically disappear when you're not at the bedside anymore. And you're now in this stressful environment. And so I think kind of this gets housed under burnout. And Mm. I think this is, you know, my own professional opinion is students say, well, I'm leaving the bedside. And I'm not going to have to worry about the stress of COVID anymore, because now I'm going to be in anesthesia school. And the burnout does not go away (laughs) because it's this cycle, right? We're here. We want to prove, we want to show that we can do it. And we let go of all those self, um, those wellness things that we know to take care of ourselves. We deny that burnout is happening. And then we start going down that bad cycle of emptiness and depression and Mm. burnout syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there is just like with mental health issues there is this stigma and shame especially if you're that person and how do you somebody's listening who who maybe is dealing with this right now and they they know that there's something not right they're not doing something right but they've got this stigma of you know if i come out i'm going to lose my job i'm going to lose my family i'm going to lose my friends Um, I can't, I can't, I can't do this. Um, and then everybody's going to look at me and always know that I'm that person. How do you deal with that? If you're, if you're out there right now, listening to this, what would you say to those folks? Oh, well, one, I would say, I know you're suffering and I know that life is hard right now. And I, I can't imagine that the situation you're in feels good. And I just want to acknowledge for a second that this is rough, but I know that you're strong and I know that you are smart and I know that you are capable to get the help that you need and you have to put yourself first and you can't listen to that little voice inside your head that's saying you can't do it or you're going to not be able to do this. Um, You've got to listen to that voice that's deep inside you that knows you can and knows you're strong. And I would also speak to that the nursing boards have really kind of had a shift in culture that we acknowledge that this is a uh, disease. This is an illness. Diabetes is a disease. Diabetes is an illness. Cardiovascular disease You know, we've got to start looking at substance use disorder the same way that we view these other diseases and disorders, right? And I don't think people bat an eye when someone takes insulin for their diabetes, just the same way that we shouldn't look at substance use disorder any any differently. Um, it's, It's a disorder and you need help. And the way that you go about getting help, I think the first step is call that helpline, that that confidential helpline. You know, as as you're talking, I'm sitting here thinking about this and thinking, you know, gosh, if a if a lump came up on your side or wherever, and you know, obviously that's abnormal, um, that could be life threatening. You know, not taking action on this could be a death sentence, and not only a death sentence, but if you're sitting out there thinking, well, gosh, there's going to be shame, there's going to be this, there's going to be that. Well, if you continue down this path, it's going to get worse. You're going to destroy your family. You're going to destroy your career. And you have the possibility of dying. So yeah. if you don't do anything, it's like that lump coming up on your side 
and you not paying attention to it or not doing anything about it. And then ultimately it kills you. Yeah. You know, and I can't pretend to know the paralyzing factor of shame. I don't want to say, Oh, just go get help. Just call this helpline. It's so easy. And that's not what I'm trying to say at all. Um, I think shame paralyzes us. And, um, but what the message I do want to say is if you are out there and you are struggling, then there are people here that want to help you and they're not going to look at you any different. Right. And they don't have to go local. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, I know that, that you're available. I know ANA has peer assistance. I know at the state levels, they have peer assistance as well. Um, not everybody has to know. Exactly. Exactly. And this is a medical condition. So you would be protected by, by law. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, any final words that you would like to leave with our listeners about this? Oh, that's so hard for me to try to wrap it up. And uh, I think I've hit my message home that the ANA is here to help you. I think, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in our accountability. We need more people willing to speak out and normalize, you know, the stigma and shame that's associated with substance use disorder. We need to promote healthy habits at work. Um, And I think the way you promote healthy habits is by starting with yourself and um, prioritizing yourself first. So I think that would be my message at the end here is you are strong and um, get more sleep, do the things that make you feel joy uh, because nobody's going to do it for you. You have to be your own, your own advocate here. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I don't know how you could end it any better than that. I mean, there's help available. There are people that care for you and that's what this is all about. And the more we talk about it, the more that the industry talks about it, the more that we talk about it on this podcast and it's at meetings and, you know, there's less shame around this subject, the better off everybody is. So Lee, thank you for being on. You did a great job and thank you for all your hard work and uh, everything you do on this subject and obviously helping students now and following your heart, you know, you, you wanted to be uh, teaching and you, you left Nashville to move to Connecticut to me, that's a little dichotomy, but anyway, I'll digress, <laughs> but, um, you know, but thank you for being on and we appreciate everything that you're doing to help the CRNA community out there. Thank you so much. This is a dream come true. I, I'm an avid podcast listener. So now I can, you know, say I have a little experience. Thank that's you right. so much. You, you did great. So Sharon, I think it's a wrap. I think so. Well, we want to thank our listeners for listening to Beyond the Mass with Jeremy Stanley and Sharon Pierce. If you like our show and want to help us grow, Sharon, how can they help us grow? Well, the best way to help us grow is to leave us a review, but make it. As we all know, there's enough negativity in this world, so leave a positive review. That's it. Five stars. Didn't your mama (laughs) tell you if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all? That's exactly right. Tell all your (laughs) friends, share us on social media, and help us to grow even more. We're in the top 50 medical podcast in the country on our way to number. Number one. We're already number one in the CRNA community. And now that, uh, you know, we, we've got our clinical episodes with Jeremy Squared and SAS coming out. That's um, right. Hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be number one uh, overall before long. But we Absolutely. couldn't do it without our listeners. Thank you guys so much. We really appreciate it. And if there are things that you want to hear about or hear us talk about, Drop us a line, email Sharon. You know, she's always there 24-7. I can give you her cell phone number, text her. It's Uh, on all bathroom walls anyway. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Till next time. It's a wrap. As a CRNA, you spend years preparing yourself for this career, so we don't want to see you lose out on any of the income you've worked so hard to earn. The best way to protect yourself and give you the confidence that a major life event won't disrupt your financial future is through disability insurance. We've known disability income specialist Robert Smith for many years and have seen the work he's done with nearly 2,000 CRNAs over multiple decades. 
He can help identify any gaps in your existing coverage and fill those gaps by finding the best value on a policy. Contact Robert and let him know you heard about him on our podcast. Send him an email at rsmithjr at financialguide.com. That's rsmithjr at financialguide.com. Or call him at 504-394-6557. Protect your greatest asset as a CRNA, yourself and your ability to earn a living by adding disability insurance to your financial plan. Today's show is brought to you by the folks at CRNA Financial Planning, an independent consulting firm that offers financial planning services exclusively to CRNAs and their families. From planning for a child's future college expenses to building a predictable income stream in retirement, the firm is committed to offering you comprehensive financial services, customized to fit your unique needs and objectives. If you have questions about your financial future, get them answered. Call the team at 855-304-3748. That's 855-304-3748. Or go online to crnafinancialplanning.com. Hi, this is Jackie Rolls, President of the International Federation of Nurse Anesthetists and President and Founder of Our Hearts, Your Hands, a global anesthesia support community that takes donations to allow nurse anesthetists in low and middle income countries to go to educational programs, buy equipment or textbooks. Your donations are tax deductible and we would appreciate your support. Be sure to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you like to listen to shows. Also, be sure to check out beyondthemaskpodcast.com. Each episode is posted there with a corresponding blog post, and we timestamp important parts of the episode to help you quickly get to the content you're looking for. Also, check out the special series section on the site. You can follow along and catch up on the CRNA History Series, episodes specifically about political conversations in the industry, or try the CRNA Personal Finance Series. It's all on beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And if you have a question for the show or want to be a guest or even suggest a particular topic, fill out the contact form on the site or send an email directly to us at info at beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And lastly, let's take the conversation social. Check out our Beyond the Mask podcast Facebook page and Facebook group.